Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. My name is Drew. If it's your first time here, a big welcome. In this channel, we are learning, exploring, sharing our understanding of functional anatomy, which is how the body works in movement particularly. So if you're an exercise physiologist, a physiotherapist, chiropractor, osteopath, a personal trainer, massage therapist, Pilates instructor, yoga teacher, uh, health and fitness person who just likes to understand the body better this is all designed for you and so what we do is what i call zoom in zoom out we zoom in and we look at individual structures and what they do in the body individually and then we zoom out and we try to put it into context in how it works within the body itself so i'm an exercise physiologist i've been practicing clinically for 20 years i'm also a chinese medicine practitioner and I sit in this nice kind of the Zen diagram of the kind of modern exercise, rehabilitation science and really traditional movement practices and how they integrate together. In today's video, we're exploring the sacroiliac joint. Now, this is a really, really complex, complex joint. There's lots of moving parts in the sacroiliac joint. And yet it's also very, very stable. And I had a very severe SIJ dysfunction for a long time, a secret electron problem due to a fall I had where I was doing handstands and I fell out of the handstand onto my back. Instead of rolling out of the handstand, for some reason, I stiffened and I managed to land right on this kind of area here. This is the, what's called the PSIS, the posterior superior iliac spine. And that really kind of, created a torsion in my sacrum and stretched all these ligaments. And then I had a huge spasm in my hip muscles and hip muscle to my lower back, a big anterior rotation. The um, sacrum here then kind of torsioned and it was a real mess. It took me a long time, probably 12 months to really get on top of that injury, uh, mainly because I got bad advice early on at the start. Bad treatment from both a physiotherapist and a chiropractor early on. Uh, really, really bad advice from what I know now. Made the injury worse. Made my recovery probably four times longer than it needed to be. Um, but in the process, uh, the way I resolved the injury was with um, acupuncture Chinese medicine to open up the channels, decrease inflammation. And actually, based on another chiropractor, a good chiropractor's advice after they helped me reposition my um, squiggle structure, I uh, started doing clinical Pilates and clinical Pilates was what really helped me kind of restore my lumbo pelvic function and, and fix my sacred iliac joint. And now I have no issues at all with my SIJ. I've gone from basically being, barely being able to walk to can run six kilometers and no problem at all. Um, so it's definitely possible to heal from an SIJ. You just like everything, you need the right advice, the right guidance, the right exercise and the right treatment. Okay. So to understand the SIJ, we're going to look at the ligaments in today's video and there's not really actually many of them so we have this ligament here the posterior sacro -iliac joint ligament and remember we are using the complete anatomy and nap complete anatomy a nap here i'll have the link in the description below so if you want to use the app maybe you can download it and follow along and that can be really helpful uh it's quite affordable and it's a great app and they're always updating it so i think it's you know, if you're trying to learn anatomy, it's a great tool. So we have posterior sacroiliac ligament joint. Um, so left and right. And then below that, we have this big ligament here called the sacrotubious ligament. And then above here, we have the iliolumbar ligament. So that's L5 and that's ilium, so iliolumbar. And on the anterior side, we have the iliolumbar ligament from the anterior side, the anterior sacroiliac ligament, and then we also have the anterior longitudinal ligament of the lumbar, which goes basically right up, up the, uh, up the spinal column. It has an attachment down here into the sacral component there. So they're the primary ligaments in the uh, SIJ joint, the actual SA joint, joint itself, if we find hide, is this joint here. So we have the ilium 
and then we have the sacrum, so sacroiliac or ilium. So this space in here is the SIJ joint. When you zoom in, you can see it's kind of shaped in this kind of um, uneven surface, and it, it kind of fits together like a jigsaw puzzle. Now, the thinking for a long time, like when I initially went through my training you know, 20 years ago, was that this joint was very fixed. Basically, it's kind of like that part of the ilium and the uh, ischium here, where it's basically one, one bone. It was kind of it was kind of considered that this is basically so fixed and immovable, there's no movement there at all. But now what we've kind of understand is that there's actually a lot of movement in the sacroiliac joint. Um, so there's movement in kind of like forward and back, a little bit of rotation as well. So it just even just a couple of degrees forward and back and rotation. What that what that kind of can do is it gives a little bit of mobility to the pelvis. So remember when you're walking, one ilium is going to be rotating forward, one ilium is going to be rotating back as you're doing this kind of movement. So we want a little bit of shifting through there. If you don't have that, then it's too rigid, it's too stiff. Um, so you, you want a bit of movement, but you don't want excessive movement where then there's too much shearing coming up and down. Because what happens then is, is that you get uneven loading through the femur, through the lumbar spine, and through these uh, ligaments and joints here. And that can kind of create a lot of issues and a lot of pain for people. Or if the, if the actual uh, sacroiliac joint gets kind of stuck, it's hypomobile, and it just gets stuck in one position, it won't move, it won't rotate. Then that means whenever time that a joint is not moving properly, then ligaments and joints above or below that have to do more with movement. So they have to make up for the extra loss of movement. And so that's how you can kind of kind of create issues above and below the joint as well. So it's, it's really quite a big joint. Uh, so if we kind of fade hide this one in the front, you can kind of see here, this is a joint itself coming up through there. Quite a big, strong joint. So you have, to, you have to really do a lot of work to injure this joint. And typically it's uh, two mechanisms that injure the sacroiliac joint. Just going back to get these other ligaments on. Go back, undo, undo, undo. Almost there, you can do it. Do, 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 do. Come on, come on, you got it, you got it. You got it. This is the one of my few gripes with this app is it can be really clunky. I'm just trying to get the limit back on. Come on, buddy. Come on. All right. So here's a little trick I've learned. So if you click on a structure you want to want to use and you go over and go post your circuit like joint, you can highlight it. And then you just kind of copy it through your mouse board shortcut. For some reason I won't do it with a mouse. And then you come over to search and then paste it in. And then you'll be able to pull up the structure straight away that you're looking for. So that's what I'll be on the right side. Nope, on the left side. There you go. So that's a little trick. Okay, so let's explore these ligaments in a bit more detail. So if you go to the posterior sacroiliac ligament, so posterior meaning on the back, so you can see it's quite a big, thick ligament. It's got lots of horizontal lines, and then it starts coming down in these oblique, almost vertical lines coming down through here. And it's attaching on to the sacrum, just kind of wraps around either side of the sacral foramen. And so that's going to basically going to be kind of keeping the sacrum in the pelvis nicely snug there. So we have a good 900 ligaments in the body and a ligament comes from the term Greek ligamente, which means to tie or hold down. So keep in mind that the role of ligaments is to keep the bones in position um, so that they can kind of move freely the way they're meant to and also maintain stability and alignment. So we have this one on the left and right. And then below that, we have the sacrotuberous ligament. So again, coming up to sacrum, we're on the inferior angle of the sacrum here, and then coming on to the 
uh, ischium. Now, one thing that will happen in sacroiliac joint dysfunction is that you'll often get a rotation or a shear of one uh, ilium relative to the other. So typically it's usually the left one because it's just anatomically structured to be a little bit more left anterior rotated already. Um, so what happens is then you get the left ilium rotating forward, the right ear ilium is a bit rotated posteriorly. So you create sort of like a twist, so a rotation. Okay. And so then that kind of transfers down into the hamstring and the glute on the opposite side. So you typically one glute will be put in a weaker position because of the rotation and the position of the pelvis. So when a muscle's in a longer position or a shorter position, they tend to go uh, weaker. So when you when you figure out which side is in the weak position, that means then that this ligament here is connected to the hamstring. So if I put in the right, uh, let's say biceps femoris, let's find it. Biceps femoris, right? Perfect. Essentially they are connected together. So the loading and the tension that goes into your right hamstring goes up into the sacrotuberous ligament. And there's a lot of fascial kind of connection coming down through here. Then transfers from the sacrotubular ligament into the thoracico lumbar fascia. And then typically it would transfer into the left QL region through here. So you get this weight transfer or what we call slings occurring so for example if this if the right side is weak for whatever reason and if this right hemisphere is either rotated a little bit too forward anteriorly when um when the hemisphere rotates anteriorly forward the actual ischium goes up this way a little bit and that puts the hamstring in a longer position so if you move if the and, uh, the pelvis rotates anteriorly, so tip tilts forward like a bowl, tilting forward. Then this will tip the ilium posteriorly back, and that will lengthen the hamstrings. So what you get is a tight but weak hamstring because it's kind of already on stretch. But when you stretch a muscle out too much, it lacks a lacks a cross uh, cross bridging, so you can't get as many fibers to cross bridge and contract, so it's in a weak position. So that can feed into a, a side in the pelvis where it has weaker stabilization because the hamstring is a primary hip extensor. So it's a primary leg movement muscle. So it's gonna move your leg back that way, but it's also a primary pelvic stabilizer and pelvic, pelvic move, mover. Because when the hamstring contracts, it's gonna pull your sit bone back down this way. So that's one of the reasons why we do a lot of hinging exercises like deadlifts or uh, just hip hinging, even with like broomsticks, is you keep your pelvis in a fairly neutral position and you use your hamstrings to pull down on this bone. Um, so it pulls down this bone and it straightens you up. So you can kind of imagine if this bone here was up there, it's going to pull down and it's going to rotate the pelvis back posteriorly and into more neutral position is what we want so you want that hip extension occurring okay if this is dumped in too much then what happens is the loading goes into the ligaments more particularly into that sacred tubus ligament and into the uh, posterior uh, sacred lack ligaments and then they can kind of create too much shear on those ligaments and they can get sprained or stretched out and if they get kind of too much stress in them too much sprain in them where, where the other muscles in the body are kind of like negating and absorbing forces, then you can get a lot of irritation in the joint. That's where you get into a lot of problem. So that's a big part of the mechanism of sacroiliac joint dysfunction is this kind of weakness from the hamstrings coming into the sacrotubus ligament and the transfer of weight through the kinetic chain isn't occurring. So then from the top, we have the iliolumbar ligament. It's a bit easier to view from the front. So that comes off. This is L5 here. 
fifth lumbar ligament. So you've got two branches of it. So you've got one more, it's coming up here on the anterior side of the PSIS, posterior superior spine. So the PSIS is really this part of the, of the pulse. And you can kind of, and this is a kind of iliac ridge coming up through here. So it's more kind of a top third of the PSIS. So if you're standing from behind, you can typically palpate this ridge on people, particularly if they're quite thin and don't have a lot of body fat on them, you can kind of easily palpate it. And it's a good landmark for a lot of therapists to kind of orientate themselves with. And typically what you're looking for is the kind of the iliac ridge, either the top of the ridge or where it drops off here is fairly even. There's a natural bit of kind of height difference naturally. Um, but it shouldn't be like really obvious. So we're looking for that nice even position just to kind of like gives you a bit of insight into the, the pelvic's position, pelvic stabilization. And then you got a second branch coming down kind of almost two thirds of the way down onto the anterior iliac fossa almost. So this whole kind of fossil bowl, but on the kind of the midline here on the anterior aspect. So that's kind of more stabilizing from the front. And then you have the anterior sacred iliac ligament, which is really just wrapping around from the inferior part of sacrum onto the ilium, big part of the sacral body here, and then almost coming up from the top. So it's kind of then joins into the posterior ligament up here as well. So it's this almost continuous, like a 360 degree wrapping from front to back. So when you have all these four ligaments um, together integrated, you have a very, very strong pelvis position. And because of the shape of the bone where it's kind of uh, very ridged, it's like a jigsaw shape. It's very, has a little bit of movement, but it's very, very um, stable. So it's difficult to get a sheer force. Um, some people though, they can kind of, if, if these ligaments are very unstable, if this is the sacrum and this is your, Ilium, essentially, in a simplistic kind of terms, you just get the shearing force or rotation. And if it gets rotation in that sacrum, it kind of jams and then it twist, creates a, a twist or a or turn because the L5 sits on top of the sacrum. So if the sacrum rotates, then L5, which sits on top of it, it's going to rotate with it. Okay. And that creates a torque or a twist. And that twist will go up the spinal column. So you could have a slight um, hypomobile SIJ joint where it's not mobilizing a little bit in the joint and it gets stuck and jammed and that's stuck in that slight bit of uh, like rotation on, or torsion. And then the lumbar spine has to compensate and it rotates as well. And then that can potentially work all the way up, up the spine. And what I've seen in a lot of cases is that when you do get this kind of torsion going on in L5, like at the base of the spine, the compensation happens up in C1, C2. And the analogy I always like to use for that is the spine is like a length of chain. So you've got seven lengths of chain here in the cervical spine, 12 lengths of chain in the thoracic spine, five in the lumbar spine and the anchor as the sacrum. So if you get a length of chain or a rope and you twist the bottom, eventually the top's going to counter rotate the other way. And that's kind of what happens um, with this position here. So a lot, a lot, a lot of lower back pain, a lot of neck pain. If there's a history of kind of pelvic injury, uh, instability, lower back pain, if we, that's not resolved well, it can create issues up and down the whole spinal column because it's also interconnected and together. And the way to resolve this is you must, must, must develop what we call lumbo pelvic stability. So learning how to use your pelvis to anteriorly and posteriorly tilt the pelvis okay, using your butt muscles and your core muscles. You need to learn how to do that. You need to learn how to stand on one leg without the hip dropping. So when you stand on the leg, if you've got weak butt muscles here, okay, your hip pulse will drop. So if I put in glute and medius, for example, which is your primary stance muscle. Go to the right side. Okay, 
Okay, so this is a very very common in a sacred electron presentation. If this muscle is weak and this and your hamstring is weak, okay, the only thing that's kind of holding you up when you stand on one leg is your ligaments potentially. And so what'll happen is you'll get a hip drop. So the pelvis will kind of like kink down to one side and the hip will go out the side a little bit. So you'll kind of like a little hip drop. I call it like a model walk. If you like watch models when they're walking down a catwalk and they're swaying the hips from side to side, uh, trying to accentuate the curves <laughs> for, for fashion. Uh, what happens is, is basically these muscles get in place in position where they're not very, very strong. And so they're not really going to stabilize too much. And you're really resting on the actual skeletal structure of the joint itself and on relying on the ligaments to hold and take that weight. And the ligaments aren't really designed to do that. So you can, you can absolutely get this kind of presentation where the glute muscles are weak, hamstrings are weak. And then typically what happens there is you get really tight hip flexors, which turn on to stabilize the lumbar and the pelvic region. So that provides stability, but then you'll lose a lot of movement and mobility as well. So it's always a trade-off between the two. So if you want to resolve your sacred elect joint condition or your SIJ dysfunction, if you've been told you've got SIJ problems, what you need to do is resolve the lumbo pelvic um, kinematics and some movement mechanics. And that can get quite complex because you've got 33 muscles on each pelvis, each side, so there's 66 muscles that need to be kind of integrated and retrained together. And if one part's out, then it can throw everything else out as well. Um, but the key is really starting with understanding pelvic tilting. So anterior and posterior pelvic tilting, get those things working. Then the muscles will start to stabilize the joints. And if the SLJ ligaments haven't been too stretched out, too uh, lengthened, because unfortunately ligaments, when they get stretched, they tend not to come back to a, a good position. They just gets like a rubber band's been stressed too much, it loses its kind of elasticity. Uh, then you lose that kind of stabilization. So that's not good. We want to avoid that. So yeah, if you once you get that kind of movement piece going, you can you can regain a lot of stability in your pelvis. You just really need to be working with someone who understands how to get the pelvis working correctly. There are different methods of doing it, but essentially it really comes down to Restore anterior pel posterior pelvic tilt with the right muscles doing the right job. That's connected to breathing respiration. Um, the reason for that is when you inhale, it's usually spinal extension. Okay, so that anterior tilt your pelvis. So that's going to be more your lower back muscle being active, uh, depending on what position you are, and maybe your glutes as well. When you exhale, it's spinal flexion. So that's where the anterior core muscles come onto it. Maybe the hip flexors and the glute medius is a helps in posterior tilting the pelvis. So you need to get those two together. So, and the best way or the best systems that do that, if you, if you can't afford to access an AP exercise physiologist or a good physio who are exercise professionals, um, if you can't afford to access them because we, you know, uh, expensive typically, <laughs> uh, what you can do is, is just start training in Pilates and or maybe a good yoga teacher uh, if the yoga te if yoga is taught correctly the way it was designed to be taught um, with the breath. So if that would be my recommendation there. A good personal trainer who understands core training really, really well could probably also help you out as well because 80% um, of what we can do for people who are, who are coming back from injury are all going to be the same exercises. Okay. So there's no real super duper special fancy exercises. The majority of conditions, the last 20 cents where we need to get really, really specialized. So if you've got a really existing SIJ problem and you've got left and right imbalances going on, left and right imbalances on the core, breathing dysfunction, if you might need to work with somebody who can kind of step you through the process of how to build that out from the inside out. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, just start, start a Pilates um, class, um, a, cool, a good core class would be getting it well and well, moving in the right direction. Okay, so I think that's probably enough to start with there in terms of your, your SIJ. 
particularly the ligaments. We've got the five uh, key ones. So we've got the posterior SIJ ligament, the sacrotibius ligament. We have here the iliolumbar ligament. And then we also have the anterior SIJ ligament. To look after your pelvis, look after your sacroiliac joint. I recommend highly either a good strength and conditioning program. If you don't have any injuries already, just training, lifting weights, strength and conditioning is great. Pilates is fantastic. Yoga can be fantastic. Uh, a good personal trainer who knows the core training really well is fantastic. People are focused more on movement quality first. Always teach movement first before you layer in intensity and, and fitness and then performance. So make sure people can do the thing. They have some, they have some skill, they understand they can control the movement, and then you layer in the fitness stuff on top. Because if you are doing movements incorrectly, you can create these injuries as well, which is something you want to avoid. Okay, guys, so that's the SIJ ligament. A quick little overview. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the comments below. If you're a bit more advanced and you're looking for some more training in SIJ, uh, I'm always open to working with people if they want to learn how to do this stuff in real life. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, give me a holler, reach out. Also, I highly recommend the Postural Restoration Institute, which is based in America. They have super advanced kind of training in functional movement. So if you've already kind of got a pretty good knowledge base and you want to take that a little bit further, uh, particularly in those terms of all those different kind of rotation components in the pelvis, then I highly recommend, you know, checking out the Postural Restoration Institute. Either way, keep, keep studying, keep learning, keep training, stay humble, be curious, and we'll see you on the next video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.